Christian Parenting. Strong Christian men honor women. How can we raise our sons toward becoming men like this? Join us today for Family Vision. Hi, my name is Ray Reno. Welcome to Family Vision with my parents, Dr. Rob and Amy Reno. Strengthening families through practical, encouraging, and real conversations. Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries, here with my sweet wife, Amy. It is great to be back in the studio again today. Well, a few weeks ago, we did a couple episodes on the lost virtue of modesty. And we had a great conversation with our daughter, Lainey. Uh, If you missed those podcasts, we'd encourage you to go back and listen to Get Caught Up. But today we wanted to talk about a necessary and related topic, which is how to train our boys to treat girls with honor and respect. So in a perfect world, we would have had our W here with us. I thought it would have been nice to have our oldest son just in on this conversation, but due to family schedules, that just didn't work out. But I am going back as we start this conversation, I'm thinking about those 10 years when you were the youth pastor at Bible Church. And I think when we first started digging deeper into these issues, Mm -hmm. both modesty, but also how you know training boys to treat girls with respect and honor reminds me that we would go on these missions trips for two weeks and we would serve meals and at every meal we always had the girls go first and that was just a standard thing right and the boys learned that they had to wait to all the girls i i remember one time um just a funny story that the boys actually made up a song at the end of the trip, how the girls needed to leave them more salad. They had put that, <laughs> it's like a regular praise song, but I, it still sticks out in my head because they were, they were a little bitter. They weren't getting enough salad after the girls went through. But other than that little tweak that we had on our missions trip, there really was no difference, we would say, in the way we viewed teenage boys versus teenage girls. There's no really intentional or distinct training And when we started having children of our own and realized that we were wanting to make sure that our sons were raised with the mindset that Mm -hmm. God had called them to be protectors of women and that they should aspire to not only treat their mom and their sisters with great respect, but all women. Like we wanted that to transfer. And I think it was very convicting, like how we were raising what we were doing in youth group. Like were we translating any of those values really to those kids in our high school ministry. And it got us kind of thinking about, you know, what is the church doing that is specifically training boys with an understanding of how they should treat girls and respect girls? Yeah, that's a great reflection on some of those experiences that we had. And as we were preparing for today, realizing that this is a major worldview clash. The the way of the world is hatred between men and women. And this has been in place since Adam and Eve sinned each sex trying to dominate and control each other. Can I just say that you said that? I think that's true, but people don't really use those words. I mean, there is this animosity and hatred that has been present from the beginning, and yet I think it's easy to not call a spade a spade and acknowledge that that's actually been there and and culturally is there. Yeah, and I think one of the principles that applies here, um, this is a bigger principle. If you latch onto it, it's going to help you uh, a lot. That if the world accuses Christianity of something, the reality is the opposite. Like mm-hmm. the world lies because of the father of lies. So what does the world say about Christianity on this issue? The world says Christianity abuses and oppresses women. I mean, how often do we hear that message? Mm-hmm. So again, train yourself. If the world tells you something, the reality is usually the opposite. Um, And this would be a bigger conversation, but I mean, look at how our secular culture treats women. Look how Hollywood treats women. They're Mm -hmm. completely sexualized and Mm -hmm. objectified, valued really just only for their outward appearance. One of my favorite books is What If Jesus Had Never Been Born by Kennedy. And he shares a thread in there about how Jesus was so radically different in treating women with equal value as men. It was just unheard of in the ancient world. And we're actually recording today. It's the day after Easter. Right. Um, you're all listening in May. But as we look at Easter in the history of the Bible, Jesus first appears to women. Women are the first to share that he's alive. And this is not by accident. Then everywhere Christianity has spread around the world, women have been increasingly elevated and honored and valued. And that doesn't mean that every 
Christian and every Christian right, institution so. has treated so. women with the proper dignity that they should have. But if you want to dig into this a little more of how we've been actually kind of brainwashed that Christianity is somehow anti-woman, uh, a real quick article on this online, uh, the title is Christianity, the best thing that ever happened to women. And it's a very thoughtful, interesting historical perspective. Christianity, the best thing that ever happened to women. But let's zoom in, honey, and talk about what this looks like when it comes to raising boys. I will do that, but I wanted to go back to what you just said as far as the cultural, what you said that was just real well-worded, that if the culture presents it, you know, that most likely the opposite is true. If there's a message that you're hearing in culture that the opposite is true, and it reminded me of uh, that talk we heard that about the Titanic of women and children first, and that was one of those talks going back to that time when we had first had kids that we came across or someone gave to us just to show us that, you know, you know about the sinking of the Titanic, we've seen the movie, but we take for granted this idea that was, you know, some of the most powerful men were on that ship. Right. And yet the cry was women and children were at first to the lifeboats and that most of the people who died were men. But we take for granted that that is culturally normal. That is purely from a Christian culture. Exactly. And I think in that talk, they did an example of a French ship that had gone down, and I don't have any names, you'll have to research this yourself, that had gone down in similar times where all the sailors and the men of the trip saved themselves and just let women go down with the ship. There wasn't a Christ honoring view of women there, you know? And so I just think that's a perfect example to research that because you take it for granted that we've grown up in this world where there's these remnants, right, of the Christian church where women were honored and elevated and treated in a way that, so we're, it's kind of distant for us to think about how women were treated when there's not that Christian base or foundation, you know? Exactly. It, that, that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. But um, yes, in parenting, you know, we were trying to develop some of these ideas and plant these principles very early on with our kids. So there was just a strong emphasis with especially our oldest son that, you know, it was his job to really be watching out for his younger sister and taking care of her. And there was a lot of, you know, whenever you got in the car, make sure the girls get in first treating them delicately in the sense with honor. I want to say delicately, not that they weren't capable and they were able to do things, but a sense that um, they deserved some special treatment. But specifically with this idea, and I go back to that Titanic talk about, you know, are we training our boys with this idea of women and children first? Are we training them with the idea that if they're in a situation, will they it's not going to be natural that you sacrifice, right, your right. well-being for the well-being of anyone <laughs> for another person. And I remember when I had this a story that I probably was a little over teaching this. I was walking out of Awana with uh, my kids, and I was with a good, good friend, a neighbor. It was kind of a, you know, we're all leaving Awana together. And apparently there was a boy at Awana like, that had come as a guest and had been really giving Lissy a hard time that night, kind of. I don't know, bullying her or saying some rude things. And and our W said to me, yeah, I was about to go punch him, punch him in the face for that, you know. And I <laughs> affirmed our W for a gallant attitude. And I just affirmed him in the sense that he had gotten into our head, like understanding this teaching of like, you know, if you see a boy a bullying yeah. your sister, you should, you know, speak up. Well, anyway, the mom called me. Yeah, my friend. Good friend. Yeah, but she called me horrified that I had said that. And I mean, and, and well, understandable. I was I, I was like, I had to walk that back to be like, no, I really don't want him to go, you know, punch this kid in the face at the church event. I'm sorry. I backed that up a lot. So, <laughs> so but it was, I was blessed that he was starting to um, get the message that we were trying to give in our home about how important it was for him to understand this role. But I also want to connect it back to the what you mentioned in the beginning, the modesty talk, because I think it's important too. We were we had those talks about the lost beauty of modesty, and how we wanted to train our girls to really think about how they you know how they dress in accordance with that being a way of respecting their Christian brothers. You know what I mean? To think about that, and in the same way, we need to be training our sons right. on how they talk about girls, what they're viewing, like on social media. But I think specifically conversations. I remember having a lot of conversations with my boys when. 
especially when they were on their sports teams. And I'd be like, well, why don't you want to hang out with that group of guys? I kind of thought, oh, why don't you want to be with that group? I felt like sometimes they were pulling themselves away. And I kind of look at it with my extroverted self like that's a bad thing, that you're pulling yourself away from being more friendly. And, And I know that they just went through phases where they would just say, mom, I don't. They, I don't want to be part of those conversations, mm-hmm. you know, and I think they were even hesitant to tell me what the conversations were about or what was being talked about. Their really only recourse, I guess, is my point, was to just kind of distance themselves to not engage in conversations that right. I knew were probably very disrespectful and sexualizing, I think, of girls yeah. and just that was kind of the norm and they had to make a choice not to be a part of that. Right. Well, we, we know we have a lot of teenagers that listen to Family Vision Hopefully, just on your own because you love it so much. But maybe with your <laughs> yeah. maybe with your parents. Um, but this the the way that you are treating your sisters, your mom, girls that are friends in your life now really directly affects Absolutely. the way you're going to treat your future wife someday. The Bible says in First Peter to show honor to your wife. So all the ways that you can learn to show honor now to sisters and girls and mom now is is practicing you up to really be uh, the best husband that God is calling you to be. And and parents, again, this may seem a little old fashioned, but uh, we do need to be teaching kind of chivalry 101. It's not something I would not give myself an A plus as a dad in teaching this consistently to our boys. I'm kind of on again, off again. And then even practicing it with you, my dear sweet (laughs) wife, I'd say not always an A plus. You know, I'll give myself some accountability here. It's a dangerous thing to do. (laughs) But, you know, occasionally I open car doors for you. Yes. Right? Not 100% of the time, but occasionally I do. And when I do, you seem to like it. You will say, thank you. Oh, that was nice. And I should get through that through my head that, oh, I should do that more. (laughs) So, um, but that's just an I know, but it's just an example. Okay. It's the basic idea of opening doors for women, right? And And I do notice. I very much noticed. Right. So you can email me at podcast at visionaryfam.com to ask how I'm doing with uh, with growing in that. But teaching our boys the basics of opening doors, of ladies first, um, uh, ordering food at a restaurant, right? When the waitress comes and says, can I get your drink orders, right? Guys, teenage guys ought to look at the ladies at the table. In other words, like wait for them uh, to place that order. This one is more of a cultural one. But when it comes to like shaking hands, the etiquette when a man is introduced to a woman is not for a man to extend his hand like you would do to another man, but allow the woman, if she wants to shake hands, allow her to extend her hand. Well, see, there you go. (laughs) Well, this is a training for sons, right? So this is a little bit of manhood training. Um, So it's a learning process. With your boys, if you expect noble perfection, you are going to be disappointed. So that's not the... Mm -hmm. The goal here, but that these can be a regular part uh, of our of our parenting discussions, particularly with our boys. Amy, do you have any other thoughts on how this sort of training can begin at home? Just that I think it's really important. I keep linking it back to the modesty issue, but um, social media with our boys, paying attention to what they are watching, and even that can be a form of disrespect when you're not paying attention to even how your boys are maybe responding if they I'm very thankful our oldest has chosen never to have social media so and our second ha, as a boy had a little bit but not a lot so I'm not saying I'm an expert on this but I do know you know even like the area of like comment section when you're commenting on a picture or or those type of things can be just something that slides through the cracks that you don't think of on how you're training your boys, what's appropriate and what would be disrespectful on how to respond. Because I think it's important for us to understand that you know we want our girls to behave a certain way. And at the same time, we need to be training our boys very intentionally because girls are going to be drawn to all those things we talked about in the modesty issue about dressing inappropriately if they're getting, that is what gets them lots of attention. Mm -hmm. So if we really wanna attack this problem as Christians, we have to tackle it from both ends and also be training our boys to not engage in that kind of over-sexualized way of looking at young women and and engaging in, and especially, so, so I'm saying there's one thing about the conversation that you're hearing, but just remember, you know, you're not hearing the conversation they're having with their friends, for one thing. Like, you know, like as parents, we don't know what it's like to be on their sports teams with them and see how the, all that goes. And then we're also, you know, from, again, from that social media, the comments that they're making or Snapchat and all of that, I think those personally are the areas where boys are much more likely to be disrespectful and to cross some lines in the things they say because there's that 
social media barrier that, mm-hmm. that you probably would never have said that in person, but you just type that emoji right. in or type that comment in and you didn't really think much about it. That can do tons of damage. Yeah. Well, let me talk just a, a little bit about that helping boys with the battle with images and, and porn. And this could be multiple podcasts in and of itself. But I think a lot of parents, they just they just think, well, I just need filters, right? I just need to block right. stuff. But the reality is you can't stop your kids from seeing pornography. <laughs> you should have the filters. You should have the blocks. Those things are important. But they see inappropriate things when they walk to the mall at the yeah. underwear store. They see inappropriate billboards. They see inappropriate things at the Super Bowl commercials at halftime. They and that's a and that's a good just to clarify because we use the word pornography, people go to this extreme. But right. I think we really want to say is just there's no filter on the world. There's no filter on the images that you are going to see. You know, I remember there were these families that took this so seriously in of our homeschool community, like they never went to a water park, never went to. I, I can't even name the list of things that they never went to in order so their boys wouldn't see these images. And I thought, you know, that's so unrealistic. I'm not. You can't live like that. You can't live in a world where you're. You're blocked from seeing things that you don't want to see. Like I go back to that quote. I I think it was C.S. Lewis. I'm not sure it was who said we've lost the freedom to not view obscene things. It's just, you know. There's sleazy stuff all over the place. There's sleazy stuff all over. We we don't have a choice. Right. So parenting our sons and our daughters, but our sons on this, you know, openness and honesty are the top values. Sharing your journey with your boys, certainly by their early teens, we want to get these conversations going in absolutely mid and late teens talking about your journey in this area. Be honest with them about your own struggles, you know, in an age appropriate way. Um, you know, I, I have a thing on my computer called Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes tracks everywhere I go on the internet. Every week, my pastor and my eldest son get a report of where my computer goes. We have this phrase, you know, no one is holy enough for a secret online life. So uh, I'm on a news site and there's a bikini girl on the side of the screen. If I want to click Bikini Girl, I can, but my son's going to find out about it and my pastor's going to find out about it. I can't do anything on that computer in secret. You know, age 10 is when we take each one of our kids to do some more intentional conversation about sexuality. And one of the things right now, I'm so proud of Ray, our 12-year-old, that when he sees something sleazy, and it could be, again, on a commercial or at the mall or whatever it is, or maybe an ad pops up on a video game, you know, he comes and tells me, and I'm just so proud of him for that. We talk about how to avoid it, sure, but we also pray, you know, Lord, don't let any of those images stay in our heads. And and it takes me, I didn't have anybody at age 12 that I could go to, to be honest with, uh, about those things. So filters and controls, those are baby steps. But the big win is open-hearted communication and men letting your boys see your heart of love for him, your desire to be pure in your thoughts and inviting your son to join you on that journey. Uh, Amy, you want to well, share one more thing? I also just think it's important that we're giving our boys a vision. You know, I, th- I always felt it was helpful to be able to talk to my younger kids about their vision for what their future would be like. What kind of husband do you want to be? What kind of wife you want to have? What is going to be valuable to you? Is It helps with the heart issues, I think, right. for boys to see that if they're going to be have the kind of character that is – Talking about girls in a very demeaning way, even among their friends and or being a certain kind of persona, that that isn't going to attract the type of girl that they really desire to have a lifelong commitment with. You know, that is an important thing for to give them a vision of why. Why don't you want to behave this way? Why do you not want to take your clues from the movies that you're watching and the music that you're listening to and go back to the fact, let's not watch those movies. Let's not listen to that music. Oh my goodness, the rap music alone, the amount of Christian boys I heard listening to this horrible music of how it depicted- How it depicted women. Women, just horrific. And they act like that doesn't affect them. But on the flip side, we have seen, I've seen this multiple times. In fact, I have a good friend whose brother is dating someone and she's just commenting constantly how her brother is treating her so much more kinder than she ever has. And she thinks it has all to do with this. He really likes this girl. He's serious about this girl. He is stepping up his game to sure. be a better person because he sees a quality young lady in his life and he's he really wants to do this right. Right. Well, you're so right to put all this in the context of future vision, right? So our kids understand that their choices right now are setting the table for these long-term relationships. Well, there's certainly a lot more we could talk about, but we hope this conversation's been an encouragement to you, a challenge to you. 
If Family Vision is helping your faith and helping your family, take a minute, tap the review button on your app. You can just click the star level that you want. More stars are better, by the way, uh, or add a comment. But when you do that, it just helps more people discover the podcast and they can find hope and help for their family relationships. As always, you can reach us at podcast at visionaryfam.com. That's podcast at visionaryfam.com. And we look forward to our next time with you on Family Vision. Family Vision.